So we spent about a lecture and a half talking about the Newtonian approach, but there's a Lagrangian approach. We should say something here about potential energy. The potential energy that the particle is experiencing due to gravity is actually pretty simple to write. This is a capital U. This is in the non-dimensional form. We have two one over R potentials. We've got the one over R related to M1, and then one over R related to M2. The non-dimensional masses are one minus mu and mu respectively. So in some sense, that's all we would have to write to say this is the potential energy. We could be more careful and say, well, this is the potential energy written in terms of X, Y, and Z. If we had written the potential energy in the Newtonian frame, this would be chi, eta, and zeta. And then there'd also be time because time would show up explicitly in R1 and R2, tracking where M1 and M2 are with respect to the particle. But now that we've gone into a, a rotating frame, we don't have to worry about that time dependence. So this is now just a function of X, Y, and Z in the rotating frame. There's another term that sometimes gets put on just for a convention. It doesn't add anything. It's just a constant term, right? For a potential energy, you could change where the datum is. You could change where the zero is. For reasons that we'll probably have to get to next time, this is the common thing that's added on. It's minus one half mu, one minus mu. It makes it so that the two triangular equilibrium points, L4 and L5, have a Jacobi constant of exactly three or a non-dimensional energy of exactly negative one and a half. So that's just put in as a convention. So that's the potential energy due to gravity. What about kinetic energy? The kinetic energy of the particle. The kinetic energy, sometimes we write this as K. We don't have to include the mass of the particle. We've just divided out by mass. So if you want, this is the kinetic energy of the particle per unit mass. So this would be chi dot squared plus eta dot squared plus theta dot squared. What we do is we write this in the rotating frame. If you substitute in what we have in the rotating frame, this will give you the following. You'll get x dot minus y squared plus y dot plus x squared plus z dot squared. And now I know that looks weird. We're not used to having things that aren't velocities in the kinetic energy. It's implied here, right, that we have, this is actually x minus ny, if you were to put the units back, squared, et cetera. But we're looking in the non-dimensional case. So that's our kinetic energy. And so this is kind of interesting. The kinetic energy seems to depend on x, y. Let's just say it depends on z. I don't know if it does. x dot, y dot, z dot. Whereas potential energies can't have any dependence on velocities. They just depend on position. Now, we're not going to look at the total energy. We're going to use the Lagrangian approach. So the Lagrangian approach, I have much more about this in other videos. I'm just going to give you some sense of the summary version. In the Lagrangian approach, you write a system in terms of some number of generalized coordinates. We usually write those as Qs, so Q1 through Qn. And then those have time rates of change, Q1 dot to Qn dot. And what you do is you write something called the Lagrangian function, which is kinetic minus potential. As long as it's written in terms of these generalized coordinates, you can write down the equations of motion. So this is the Lagrangian approach. The equations of motion are Lagrange's equations. And Lagrange's equations are, you take the total derivative of partial L, partial QI dot. So you, that's that D by DT, take the total derivative. I guess here we're doing um, tau as the time. So, so as not to confuse you, we've got that. And then this is minus partial L, partial QI. And this is set equal to zero. You have one of these for each of the generalized coordinates. So the index i goes from one to n. The right-hand side is zero here because all of the forces are included in either the kinetic or potential energy terms. 
if we had things that were non-conservative or if we had rocket thrust or solar sail, it would show up in the right-hand side here as something called a generalized force. For the problem we have at hand, so for the circular restricted three-body problem, our generalized coordinates are X, Y, and Z, and then their time rates of change. I think these are sometimes called generalized velocities, X dot, Y dot, Z dot. And we've got the kinetic energy and the potential energy written in terms of the rotating frame. So the theory of Lagrangian says, you can just write down the kinetic minus the potential energy, even if it's in a rotating frame, and you'll get the correct equations of motion. So it's very powerful. So if we were to write L, this is just K minus U from up above, we could write the Lagrange's equations of motion here. So if we were to take the X equation, this is D by D tau, uh, partial L, partial X dot. And then I'll just write it this way, equals partial L, partial X. So like over here, I just move this over to the right-hand side. And what do I get? If I look at what partial L, partial X dot is, the only dependence on X dot is in the K term right here. So I actually get X dot minus Y. So I'm taking the total derivative of that. And then this equals partial L, partial X. And what's partial L, partial X? There's dependence in both U, but also the kinetic energy. There's dependence on X right there. So if I work this out, I will get Y dot plus X and then minus, and I'll just write partial U, partial X. And one could work that out. What do we get here? We'll get X double dot minus two Y dot minus x equals negative partial u partial x. And the right-hand side equals the right-hand side that we got before from the Newtonian approach. You could work it out if you want. This just gives things a lot quicker. You don't have to do all that algebra with rotation matrices. If I did the y equation, something similar would happen. d by d tau of, what will it be? y dot plus x equals, because we're taking the derivative of this with respect to y, we'll get a minus sign. So this will actually be minus x dot minus y minus partial u partial y. And so that'll become what you would expect, y double dot plus 2x dot minus y equals minus partial u partial y. And the Z equation, pretty easy, just be D by D tau of Z dot equals negative partial U partial Z. So this is just Z double dot. So just to reiterate the right-hand sides here, partial U partial Q I, negative partial U partial Q are the same. If you just take the partial derivative, are the same as one gets from the Newtonian approach, but it's just a lot quicker. There's also something for Lagrangian systems where there's a constant of motion, and this ends up becoming important. For Lagrangian systems where partial L, partial T, and or I guess in this case, tau, where the Lagrangian doesn't explicitly depend on time, there's a constant of motion. And this is true for all Lagrangian systems that have this, but it's called the Jacobi integral or a Jacobi constant. Where this gets used the most is celestial mechanics, three-body problem, but this is true for any Lagrangian system. What is that constant of motion? It's sometimes written as partial L, partial QI dot times QI dot, you sum over all of them. So you have that, and then you just subtract off L. And that is a constant of motion. The symbol for it, some people call it little h. This is just one scalar, and this is a constant throughout the motion. If we look at what this becomes for the system we have here, the three-body problem. For the three-body problem, this ends up being one half x dot squared, y dot squared plus z dot squared. So it looks like the magnitude of the velocity as viewed in the rotating frame minus two, something called U bar. This is an effective potential because we've got these, maybe you've, you've noticed up here, we've got this negative gradient of a potential energy, but then we also have this negative X. Well, we could 
absorb that negative X in the potential energy. And same thing over here, this negative Y, we could absorb it into the potential energy. So this gets absorbed in something called the effective potential. So U bar is minus one half X squared plus Y squared plus the usual U. The U without the bar is the U that comes from gravity. And this part is the centrifugal force. There's also a Coriolis force. Anytime you see like negative two and plus two and things like that, that means that's a Coriolis force. So this might be a good time to bring in a figure of what this U bar looks like. This shows the effective potential, but then I cut it off below some certain value. So the motion of the particle P is motion in this effective potential plus Coriolis force. So it's as if you've got this thing and it's rotating around. And so you get those other terms, centrifugal force. The Coriolis force is velocity dependent. The centrifugal force is not, it's just position dependent. How far are you from the middle of the rotating frame? This shows the potential energy only limited to X and Y. This is just looking at Z equals zero, but it gives you a good idea. You could think of a, a marble, if you want, moving along this surface, but with a Coriolis force, if you can imagine that. Plus this effective potential, all of the critical points, there's five of them, and they're the five equilibrium points. So we've marked them here. There's L4, L5. And then L1, L2, and L3 are saddle points. So M1 is somewhere over here, and then M2 somewhere over there. The centrifugal force just depends on position. The Coriolis force is velocity dependent. So that's the centrifugal force there. The, the Coriolis force comes from these terms. And that's what leads to if you've looked at the motion of things in rotating frames, you get these weird loop to loops. And it's it's because of these rotating frame terms. So viewing orbits in the rotating frame takes some getting used to, but we have to do it if we're going to do anything, say, near the Lagrange points. So I think I'll stop there for today, and we'll continue next time looking at this idea of the Jacobi constant, because it helps us look at the, the regions of possible motion, and then, of course, these Lagrange points, as they've come to be called. How do we find them? Where are they? maybe some things about that. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe, or just wait and watch the next video in the series.